Section 39 of The Valley of the Moon by Jack London. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 3, Chapter 4 Billy sat motionless on the edge of the bed in their little room in San Jose that night, amusing expression in his eyes. Well, he remarked at last, with a long-drawn breath, all I got to say is, there's some pretty nice people in this world after all. Take Mrs. Mortimer. Now she's the real goods, regular old American. A fine, educated lady, Saxon agreed, and not a bit ashamed to work at farming herself. And she made it go, too. On twenty acres, no ten, and paid for them and all the improvements, and supported herself and four hired men, a Swede woman and a daughter, and her own nephew, it gets me, ten acres, why my father never talked less than one hundred and sixty acres. Even your brother Tom still talks in quarter sections, and she was only a woman, too. We was lucky in meeting her. Wasn't it an adventure, Saxon cried? That's what comes from traveling. You never know what's going to happen next. It jumped right out at us, just when we were tired and wondering how much farther to San Jose. We weren't expecting it at all, and she didn't treat us as if we were tramping, and that house, so clean and beautiful. You could eat off the floor. I never dreamed of anything so sweet and lovely as the inside of that house. It smelt good, Billy supplied. That's the very thing. It's what the woman's pages call atmosphere. I didn't know what they meant before. That house has beautiful, sweet atmosphere. Like all your nice underthings, said Billy. And that's the next step after keeping your body sweet and clean and beautiful. It's to have your house sweet and clean and beautiful. But it can't be a rented one, Saxon. You've got to own it. Landlords don't build houses like that. Just the same. One thing stuck out plain. That house was not expensive. It wasn't the cost. It was the way. The wood was ordinary wood you can buy in any lumber yard. Why, our house on Pine Street was made out of the same kind of wood. But the way it was made was different. I can't explain, but you can see what I'm driving at. Saxon revisioned the little bungalow they had just left, repeated absently. That's it, the way. The next morning they were early afoot, seeking through the suburbs of San Jose, the road to San Juan and Monterey. Saxon's limp had increased. Beginning with a burst blister, the heel was skinning rapidly. Billy remembered his father's talks about care of the feet and stopped at a butcher shop to buy five cents worth of mutton tallow. That's the stuff, he told Saxon. Clean foot gear and the feet well greased. We'll put some on as soon as we're clear of town. And we might as well go easy for a couple of days. Now, if I could get a little work so you could rest up several days. It'd be just a thing. I'll keep my eye peeled. Almost on the outskirts of town, he left Saxon on the county road and went up a long driveway to what appeared a large farm. He came back beaming. It's all hunky-dory, he called as he approached. We'll just go down to that clump of trees by the creek and pitch camp. I start working in the morning, two dollars a day, and board myself. It'd been a dollar and a half if he furnished the board. I told him I liked the other way best, that I had my camp with me. The weather's fine, and we can make out a few days till your foot's in shape. Come on, we'll pitch a regular, decent camp. How did you get the job, Saxon asked, as they cast about, determining their campsite. Wait till we get fixed, and I'll tell you all about it. It was a dream, a cinch. Not until the bed was spread, the fire built, and a pot of beans boiling, did Billy throw down the last armful of wood and begin. In the first place, Benson's no old-fashioned geezer. You wouldn't think he was a farmer to look at him. He's up to date, sharp as tacks, talks and acts like a businessman. I could see that, just by looking at his place, before I seen him. He took about fifteen seconds to size me up, can you plow, says he. Sure thing, I told him. No horses. I was hatched in a box stall, says I. 
And just then, you remember that four-horse load of machinery that come in after me? Just then it drove up. How about four horses, he asks, casual-like. Right to home. I can drive him to a plow, a sewing machine, or a merry-go-round. Jump up and take them lines, then, he says, quick and sharp, not wasting seconds. See that shed? Go round the barn to the right and back in for unloading. And right here I want to tell you, it was some nifty driving he was asking. I could see by the tracks the wagoned all been going round the barn to the left. What he was asking me was too close work for comfort, a double turn, like an S, between a corner of a paddock and around the corner of the barn to the last swing. And to eat into the little room there was, there were piles of manure just thrown out of the barn and not hauled away. But I wasn't letting on nothing. The driver gave me the lines, and I could see he was grinning, sure I'd make a mess of it. I bet he couldn't have done it himself. I never let on, and away we went, me not even knowing the horses. But say, if you'd seen me throw them leaders clean to the top of that manure, till the nigh horse was scraping the side of the barn to make it, and the off hind hub was cutting the corner post of the paddock to miss by six inches. It was the only way. And them horses was sure buttes. The leaders slacked back and damn near sat down on their single tree when I threw the back into the wheelers and slammed on the brake and stopped on the very precise spot. You'll do, Benson says. That was good work. Aw, oh, shucks, I says, indifferent as hell. Give me something real hard. He smiles and understands. You've done that well, he says, and I'm particular about who handles my horses. The road ain't no place for you. You must be a good man gone wrong. Just the same, you can plow with my horses starting in tomorrow morning. Which shows how wise he wasn't. I hadn't showed I could plow. When Saxon had served the beans and Billy the coffee, she stood still a moment and surveyed the spread meal on the blankets. The canister of sugar, the condensed milk tin, the sliced corned beef, the lettuce salad, and sliced tomatoes, the slices of fresh French bread, and the steaming plates of beans and mugs of coffee. What a difference from last night, Saxon exclaimed, clapping her hands. It's like an adventure out of a book. Oh, that boy I went fishing with. Think of that beautiful table and that beautiful house last night. And then look at this. Why, we could have lived a thousand years on end in Oakland and never met a woman like Mrs. Mortimer, nor dreamed a house like hers existed. And Billy, just to think, we've only just started. Billy worked for three days while insisting that he was doing very well. He freely admitted that there was more in plowing than he had thought. Saxon experienced quiet satisfaction when she learned he was enjoying it. I never thought I'd like plowing much, he observed, but it's fine. It's good for the leg muscles, too. They don't get exercise enough in teaming. If I ever train for another fight, you'd bet I'd take a whack at plowing. And, you know, the ground has a regular good smell to it. Turning over and turning over, gosh, it's good enough to eat that smell, and it just goes on turning up and over, fresh and thick and good all day long. And the horses are Joe Dandies. They know their business as well as a man. That's one thing. Benson ain't got a scrub horse on the place. The last day Billy worked, the sky clouded over. The air grew damp. A strong wind began to blow from the southeast. And all the signs were present of the first winter rain. Billy came back in the evening with a small roll of old canvas he had borrowed, which he proceeded to arrange over their bed on a framework so as to shed rain. Several times he complained about the little finger of his left hand. It had been bothering him all day, he told Saxon, for several days slightly, in fact, and it was as tender as a boil, most likely a splinter, but he had been unable to locate it. He went ahead with storm preparations, elevating the bed on old boards which he lugged from a disused barn falling to decay on the opposite bank of the creek. 
Up upon the boards he heaped dry leaves for a mattress. He concluded by reinforcing the canvas with additional guys of odd pieces of rope and baling wire. When the first splashes of rain arrived, Saxon was delighted. Billy betrayed little interest. His finger was hurting too much, he said. Neither he nor Saxon could make anything of it, and both scoffed at the idea of a felon. It might be a runaround, Saxon hazard. What's that? I don't know. I remember Mrs. Caddy had one once, but I was too small. It was the little finger, too. She poulticed it, I think, and I remember she dressed it with some kind of salve. It got awful bad, and finished by her losing the nail. After that it got well quick, and a new nail grew out. Suppose I make a hot bread poultice for yours. Billy declined, being of the opinion that it would be better in the morning. Saxon was troubled, and as she dozed off, she knew that he was lying, restlessly wide awake. A few minutes afterward, roused by a heavy blast of wind and rain on the canvas, she heard Billy softly groaning. She raised herself on her elbow and with her free hand, in the way she knew, manipulating his forehead and the surfaces around his eyes, soothed him off to sleep. Again she slept, and again she was aroused, this time not by the storm, but by Billy. She could not see, but by feeling she ascertained his strange position. He was outside the blankets and on his knees, his forehead resting on the boards, his shoulders writhing with suppressed anguish. She's pulsing to beat the band, he said when she spoke. It's worse'n a thousand toothaches, but it ain't nothing. If only the canvas don't blow down. Think what our folks had to stand. He gritted out between groans, while my father was out in the mountains, and the men with him got mauled by a grizzly, clean clawed to the bones all over, and they was out of grub and had to travel. Two times out of three, when my father put him on the horse, he fainted away. He had to be tied on, and that lasted five weeks, and he pulled through. Then there was Jack Quigley. He blowed off his whole right hand with the bursting of a shotgun, and the hunting dog pup he had with him ate up three of the fingers, and he was all alone in the marsh and... But Saxon heard no more of the adventures of Jack Quigley. A terrific blast of wind parted several of the guys, collapsed the framework, and for a moment buried them under the canvas. The next moment, canvas, framework, and trailing guys were whisked away into the darkness, and Saxon and Billy were deluged with rain. Only one thing to do, he yelled in her ear, gather up the things and get into that old barn. They accomplished this in the drenching darkness, making two trips across the stepping stones of the shallow creek and soaking themselves to the knees. The old barn leaked like a sieve, but they managed to find a dry space on which to spread their anything but dry bedding. Billy's pain was heart-rendering to Saxon. An hour was required to subdue him to a doze, and only by continuously stroking his forehead could she keep him asleep. Shivering and miserable, she accepted a night of wakefulness gladly, with the knowledge that she kept him from knowing the worst of his pain. At the time when she decided it must be past midnight, there was an interruption. From the open doorway came a flash of electric light, like a tiny searchlight which quested about the barn, and came to rest on her and Billy. From the source of light, a harsh voice said, Aha, I've got you. Come out of that. Billy sat up, his eyes dazzled by the light. The voice behind the light was approaching and reiterating its demand that they come out of that. What's up? Billy asked. Me was the answer. And wide awake, you bet. The voice was now beside them, scarcely a yard away, yet they could see nothing on account of the light, which was intermittent, frequently going out for an instant as the operator's thumb tired on the switch. Come on, get a move on, the voice went on. Roll up your blankets and trot along. I want you. Who in hell are you? Billy demanded. I'm the constable. Come on. Well, what do you want? 
You, of course, the pair of you. What for? Vagrancy. Now hustle. I ain't going to loaf here all night. Ah, chase yourself, Billy advised. I ain't a vague. I'm a working man. Maybe you are and maybe you ain't, said the constable. But you can tell that to Judge Newsbomber in the morning. Why, you, you stinking dirty cur, you think you're going to pull me, Billy began. Turn the light on yourself. I want to see what kind of ugly mug you got. Pull me, huh? Pull me. For two cents, I'd get up there and beat you to a jelly, you. No, no, Billy, Saxon pleaded. Don't make trouble. It would mean jail. That's right, the constable approved. Listen to your woman. She's my wife, and you speak of her as such, Billy warned. Now get out, if you know what's good for yourself. I've seen your kind before, the constable retorted, and I've got my little persuader with me. Take a squint. The shaft of light shifted, and out of the darkness, illumined with ghastly brilliance, they saw thrust a hand holding a revolver. The hand seemed a thing apart, self-existent, with no corporeal attachment, and it appeared and disappeared like an apparition as the thumb pressure wavered on the switch. One moment they were staring at the hand and the revolver, the next moment an impenetrable darkness, and the next moment again at the hand and the revolver. Now I guess you'll come, the constable gloated. Got another guess coming, Billy began. But at that moment the light went out. They heard a quick movement on the officer's part and the thud of the light stick on the ground. Both Billy and the constable fumbled for it, but Billy found it and flashed it on the other. They saw a gray-bearded man clad in streaming oilskins. He was an old man who reminded Saxon of the sort she had been used to see in Grand Army processions on Decoration Day. "'Give me that stick,' he bullied. Billy sneered a refusal. I'll put a hole through you by criminy. He leveled the revolver directly at Billy, whose thumb on the switch did not waver, and they could see the gleaming bullet tips in the chambers of the cylinder. Why, you whiskery old skunk, you ain't got the grit to shoot sour apples, was Billy's answer. I know you're kind, brave as lions, when it comes to pulling miserable, broken-spirited bindle stiffs but as leery as a yellow dog when you face a man. Pull that trigger. Why, you pusillanimous piece of dirt, you'd run with your tail between your legs if I said boo. Suiting action to the word, Billy let out an explosive boo, and Saxon giggled involuntarily at the startle it caused in the constable. I'll give you a last chance, the latter grated through his teeth. Turn over that light stick and come along peaceable or I'll lay you out. Saxon was frightened for Billy's sake, and yet only half frightened. She had a faith that the man dared not fire, and she felt the old familiar thrills of admiration for Billy's courage. She could not see his face, but she knew in all certitude that it was bleak and passionless in the terrifying way she had seen it when he fought the three Irishmen. You ain't the first man I killed, the constable threatened. I'm an old soldier, and I ain't squeamish over blood. And you ought to be ashamed of yourself, Saxon broke in, trying to shame and disgrace peaceable people who've done no wrong. You done wrong sleeping here, was his vindication. This ain't your property. It's again the law, and folks that go again the law go to jail, as the two of you'll go. I've sent many a tramp up for thirty days for sleeping in this very shack. Why, it's a regular trap for him. I got a good glimpse of your faces and could see you as tough characters. He turned on Billy. I fooled enough with you. Are you going to give up and come peaceable? I'm going to tell you a couple of things, old hoss, Billy answered. Number one, you ain't going to pull us. Number two, we're going to sleep the night out here. Give me that light stick, the constable demanded peremptorily. Go on, whiskers. You're standing on your foot. Beat it. Pull your freight. As for your torch, you'll find it outside in the mud. Billy shifted the light until it illuminated the doorway, and then threw the stick as he would pitch a baseball. They were now in total darkness, and they could hear the intruder gritting his teeth in rage. 
Now start your shooting and see what'll happen to you, Billy advised menacingly. Saxon felt for Billy's hand and squeezed it proudly. The constable grumbled some threat. What's that? Billy demanded sharply. Ain't you gone yet? Now listen to me, Whiskers. I've put up with all your shenanigans I'm going to. Now get out or I'll throw you out. And if you come monkeying around here again, you'll get yours. Now get. So great was the roar of the storm that they could hear nothing. Billy rolled a cigarette. When he lighted it, they saw the barn was empty. Billy chuckled. Say, I was so mad, I clean forgot my run around. It's only just beginning to tune up again. Saxon made him lie down and receive her soothing ministrations. There's no use moving till morning, she said. Then, just as soon as it's light, we'll catch a car in the San Jose, rent a room, get a hot breakfast, and go to a drugstore for the proper stuff for poulticing or whatever treatment's needed. But Benson, Billy demurred, I'll telephone him from town. It will only cost five cents. I saw he had a wire. And you couldn't plow on account of the rain, even if your finger was well. Besides, we'll both be mending together. My heel will be all right by the time it clears up, and we can start traveling. End of section 39